Welcome everyone to Map Time. Uh, we are happy to see you all, or be seen by you all. <coughs> um, we, uh, in case this is your first time uh, being here, this is a series hosted by uh, me, David Weimer from the Harvard Map Collection, and Garrett Nelson from the Le Norman B. Lemonthal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. And we, um, it's a series of talks, uh, interviews with different people that work with maps, uh, that study maps. Uh, so they work in map libraries or uh, they're researchers or people that make maps as well. Um, so different practitioners of cartography. Um, we're here every Thursday at noon, um, coming to you live. So today uh, we'll be talking with David Medeiros, uh, who's the GIS Reference and Instruction Specialist for the Stanford Geospatial Center uh, at the Brainerd Earth Sciences Library. Uh, his primary role is facilitating the use and understanding of GIS software and the ab application of geospatial science to help folks with their research and their teaching and learning. Uh, but he's also an avid uh, map maker, especially for maps uh, in print. And so we'll be talking with him about all sorts of things. Um, you can see the full schedule at our uh, site on the Harvard Library website. So just plug in Harvard Library Map Time into your favorite search engine, and you can find the full schedule. Um, but we're uh, we have great uh, great people we're going to talk to through the uh, middle of July so far, and we're we're still scheduling more people. So uh, without further ado, we'll bring David in. can find him. There we go. Oh, no. no. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Yeah, how's it going? Good. Welcome to Map Time. Um, so, yeah, the, you know, you, you sent me a few maps that I thought uh, were really interesting. Um, and so, uh, let me see if I can bring them up here. Um, I particularly like this map of of Mount Hood. Um, yeah. But um, why don't I? I'm just going to bring it up on my screen. Actually, that might be easier. Um, so yeah, this guy. There we go. Um, so what are we? What are we looking at with this map of Mount Hood, um, and how how does it differ than, you know, maybe a regular map uh, in quotation marks of of the same area? Yeah, uh, I'm glad you put the quotation marks around a regular map because, what's a regular map? I I don't know. Um, it's so the the story behind this map is. Um, of the of the different kinds of things that I get to do at Stanford or or um, you know any other kind of digital mapping that I do, this is sort of the most free form sort of thing. This this didn't have any particular purpose. I wasn't doing this for anybody other than myself. Um, this was brought on by uh, um, me. You know, pr I think I was probably um, looking around my social media feed and came across um, a, a posting of a really nice looking landscape painting called I Nora Ishevet um, by Edward, George Edward Otto Saul, I think. I can't, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly. It's a beautiful painting of a, some kind of a, a coastal scene with these huge glaciers in the background that had this amazing greeny blue and yellow iridescent kind of color not kind of coming off of them but it's almost sort of radiating through them they looked like jello sort of they're they were translucent and i just as soon as i saw it as with a lot of sort of creative cartography i thought oh that's really cool i want to make a map that looks like that um and and mount hood is just sort of a great um, template for me. I, I like the, the, the uniformity of the structure. I do a lot of work in shaded relief and that's sort of the main thing that's going on in this map is its terrain representation. And so I use Mount Hood and mountains like this to kind of play with ideas. So I, um, what I did was I sort of deconstructed the color scheme and, and, um, and some of what made the painting interesting to me and tried to apply it to a map in shaded relief. And 
Um, it might be a little hard to see here on, on this screen, but if you go to my website, you can probably see this in closer detail. But I was playing around with these sort of bluey greens and, and, and little yellow colors and trying to make that come through the terrain and, and, uh, and sort of have some of that translucent effect that the original painting had. I didn't succeed in, in replicating the painting by a go figure, a landscape painting master. Um, but I still came out, I still think I kind of made something that was interesting. Um, and, and the idea behind projects like this for me is um, it's a creative outlet. So I just like, you can't, when you make things and you're interested in something, you just kind of have to make these kinds of things over and over again. So I made this just for fun for me because I, I wanted to see it made. Um, but it's also uh, like a learning pro process, right? So you, you see things and I, I use these as self-teaching projects. And so it was sort of a, uh, going down a little process of, of running through a typical terrain building process that I normally do, but trying to play with colors in different ways um, than I'm used to and, and extracting color schemes from other pieces of art or imagery and applying them to a map. And so that was the, the process I was trying to learn by building this map. That sounds great. And so what kind of, um, so I think part of what I hear you saying is you're, um, communicating something about the the feeling of the landscape that you get from a landscape painting uh, in a map. Um, and so trying to, in that sense, a little bit expanding what kind of um, work that a map can do in thinking about um, what the, what the landscape is and I think shaded relief is a, is a great way of going about that. And uh, thinking yeah. about that, I know that the, there's a great, um, you know, Erwin Royce's textbook on, on general cartography, he goes through all the different kinds of way of showing relief. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really instructive to see those, how they've changed over time. Yeah, Rice, Rice and then uh, Edward Imoff both have some great information on, um, on techniques for doing shaded relief. And there's, there's so many, many different styles of representing terrain. Um, it's, it's sort of, you know, even in even in low low relief parts of the world, it's it, the terrain representation makes up so much of what a map can be, um, depending on the kind of map you're building. But yeah, um, and so can you describe a little bit of the process that goes into uh, doing some of this work with shaded relief? Yeah, um, so it's shaded relief can be a really laborious part of making a map if you can. If you have a map to make that, that doesn't have to have shaded relief on it, go ahead and omit it um, because it, it's, you either have to put a lot of work into it to get it to look nice or um, you'll make a quick shaded relief and it, it won't really do anything to, to help the map you're making. Uh, I, um, so that's not how I approach it. Is it, it. The shaded relief, if it's going to be a character in the map, then it's, it's got to have a lot. I have to spend a lot of time on it. So a map like this, um, there's really not very many different pieces of data that went into that map. The, there's really only one core piece of data that the whole thing is built from, and it's a single digital elevation model data set, a single DEM of Mount Hood. Um, probably, I think it was a, a 10 meter um, mm -hmm. SRTM or something like that, um, or Aster. Um, so it's just a, a standard GIS elevation data set. Um, and I, I cut it out from Mount Hood. And then that one piece of data, after doing a little bit of processing in some GIS software, goes on to be several different components of the map. So, the, so first it becomes the shading for the mountain. So you, you shade it. And I use uh, software called Natural Scene Designer. Um, lately I've started playing around with Blender, which is an open source rendering program. But I tend to use, I tend to use non GIS software to do this You make the shading. Um, and then I'll use another piece of software with the same data to create uh, texture shading, which um, looks a little like the original shading, but it brings in a little more fine detail. It has less of this, these sort of light and dark facets to the map, these defined areas of light and dark, and it just produces sort of this fine texture all over the place, and you can press them together and you get a much more realistic looking shading. Um, then it gets used to produce the hypsometric tints, so the, that that green to blue sh color ramp. If you look closely, it's actually going from sort of a one color greeny blue to a different, you know, saturation greeny blue at the top. And, and so the elevation in the, in the data set helps define where all that goes. And you spend a lot of time um, changing your breaks to, to get that to sort of look correct across the whole span of your relief. 
Uh, and then finally, the elevation model um, is the input, in a sense, to creating illumination. So um, if, again, if you can see closely into that map, you'd see that certain slopes ha have a blue cast to their, their shadowed side, and they have a yellow cast to their sunward facing side. And that yellow cast or illumination is itself another separate layer in the whole process. And so I don't know, there's like, there's four, at least four different layers that are compressed into what eventually just becomes the background to everything else that goes on the map. Oh, uh, also the contour lines are also derived from the elevation data set. So like five different layers all come off that one piece of data. You break them all off and you, you, you process them separately and do different things with them. And then you, you start to recombine them. Um, the background elevation layer gets recombined in Photoshop and, and a lot of blending and stuff goes on in there to produce a single map background that I then work with in Adobe Illustrator. It's layer on things, in this case, contour lines as vectors. And uh, there's like a light, um, a light overlay for permanent ice and snow on the mountain top. And so that's also vectorized and that's done in, in Adobe Illustrator and then any sort of marginalia. And if this was a real map that I were producing for some other purpose, I might've put like trail lines and roads and other features uh, on the map, labels and all that sort of stuff. Um, that wasn't really the point of the map. I just wanted to have a map of this terrain relief. Um, yeah. So that's kind, of, that's kind of the general process for something like this. And most of the uh, reference -y kind of maps that I make um, follow that same basic formula. It starts with an elevation model and then kind of all these different layers get broken out and eventually, you know, layered with data for roads and rivers and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. And are you, when you combine the layers, are you doing that uh, usually in a imaging processing software or in the GIS software? Um, for stuff like this, I'm, I'm really only in standard GIS software at the very beginning to process the elevation model, usually just to clip it and put it into the right coordinate system that I need to be in. Um, maybe to process some of the other input data, so line work for roads and rivers and things. It usually shows up in the, in the GIS first just to do some basic clipping. And then I'll bring it all over into, I work mostly in Adobe Illustrator and I use some software that sits on top of Adobe, um, it's called Map Publisher. It's a plugin that turns Illustrator into a kind of GIS that lets you read geospatial files and it just plots them directly as artwork in Adobe Illustrator and it maintains all of the georeferencing and all of the attributes. And so you can do some GIS-y things in Illustrator, buffers and attribute selections and all sorts of um, different um, ge you know, geometric geospatial work, um, but Adobe Illustrator will sort of maintain the, the, the geography of it. And so that's yeah. how I work. So the GIS for these kinds of things is, is um, more of a starting place. I'll go back to it periodically to do some kind of data prep or, or data cleaning and then bring it back into the graphic work, the graphic um, applications I use. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I think it, it's, it's instructive for people that do less map making to realize that, you know, it, it's happening in a whole different set of diff of programs for different things that you're doing. And so it's not always uh, a, uh, and that, you know, emphasizing again, that maps are not just the simple representation of data, but this complex play, then there's a lot of choices involved. No, I mean, the, the, the old adage of like, you know, the simpler you want something to be, the longer it's going to take to make is, is absolutely true. With map making, the, the cleaner, the simpler, the more efficient a map needs to be to do its job to communicate something, the more time it's going to take to make that map like that. It's really easy to throw a bunch of layers into something and, and, and make a map. Uh, designing a map takes a lot more time and, and um, it's not that hard. I mean, it, they, there are sort of some really basic things that most people can do right off the bat that help clean up almost any digital map they're working on. And then all the rest of it is just sort of how much time do you want to spend fiddling with little details and cartographers love to spend a lot of time fiddling with little details, things that only yeah. we notice. But um, I, sh I should say that that's, you know, that's my workflow, all of the software that I use. I, I like to try different things. I love when I find a new little tool that does something. Um, I have another map of Mount Hood that I produced a while ago where I found some tool online that um, takes photos that you feed it and it makes a stipple. Uh, it like produces the same image as a stipple representation. Yeah. And of course I thought I got to put a map in Mount Hood in it and I got to
simple representation of my hood out of it. So I love to just kind of find little tools out there. Um, but you know, you can, all the kind of weird stuff I do, um, it is all doable in standard GIS software too. It's just mm -hmm. sometimes the, the, the buttons are harder to find, but, um, yeah. for the most part, GIS software can produce straight in the box in, in the application, pretty similar yeah. results. Um, it may just yeah. take a little longer. Yeah. Um, no, but I think that's you know, a lot of talking to different people. I know that make maps regularly. It's, it's always a play between finding what's where, what applications it's easiest for you to do different and have make different effects in whether it's, you know, straight up in uh, code or yeah. in an imaging processing software or in yeah. uh, a GIS application. I think it's, it's important to emphasize how different tools go into that because I think it helps put it in a larger historical perspective, thinking about, you know, someone making a lithographic map, you know, they're going to they do right. different parts with different technologies. Um, right. And so thinking about that kind of combination of technologies that's going into any of these maps, I think is, tells it, tells, makes it, allows us to tell an interesting story about what maps do and how they're made. Yeah. There's so many different ways to put a map together, whether it's yeah. just, it's in a computer or pen and ink or stitching it into fabric or whatever. Right. And uh, the, the design principles more or less are the same for any of these processes. Yeah. So you can kind of pick and choose whatever thing you think is a cool way to make a map and, mm -hmm. and make it. Um, and so what kind of, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, designing a digital map and a print map, but what kind of considerations go in for you in those two different formats? Um, you know, it's, for me, digital and print aren't that far apart from each other. And that's just because I, everything I do, even though most of the work I do is with the idea that it's a, if not a print map, it's a static map. It's, mm -hmm. it's intended to sort of just be a, a fixed representation of something. You're not going to change it by interacting with it. Um, and in that sense, digital and print are fairly similar other than knowing sort of the final place the map will be seen. Mm -hmm. So screen and paper have these very different kind of parameters for, for um, what things will look like when they're on them and what you can get away with in terms of um, how fine the details can be or how big the type has to be and that sort of thing. Um, Again, the principles mm -hmm. are mostly the same for me, but it, it's so it's it's stuff like color and saturation and line thickness and 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 um, and how again how big labels would be. Things look very different on screen um, because you're getting you know photons of color blasted at you, and then when you print it, it's not this you know it's just reflected light, and so you get different colors and different amounts of brightness and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, my screen it's, is illustrating that right now is with all these wavy, wavy yeah. lines. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, 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 and with screen, there's so many more. It's, it's also just like the size, right? So am I, do I expect people to walk around and, and be looking at this all the time on a mobile phone? Or do I think that, they, yeah. that it's really only going to be useful on a web page, on a, on a, on a desktop or a, a full-size laptop or that sort of thing? And so those constraints, again, just they change, you know, all of those different um, variables for, for color and line weights and all this sort of stuff. And a lot of times you just have to make it, iterate through, play with it, go and look at it where it's going to be, come back, make it again. So I spend a lot of time making maps. I think I probably always start out with the idea that it, I'm, I'm designing it like I would design a print map because that's just my background. That's where I started in cartography was always in print mapping. And so a lot of times I build a map like a print map and then go look at it. Maybe it's going to be online where it's going to be and realize, oh, my God, I've got a, all of these type, all this labeling needs to be like three times larger than it is. Um, and the colors need to change that sort of thing. So it's just a process of making it, going and looking at it, going back and iterating this sort of circle of making adjustments. And so you like it and you like it where it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that important the distinction between static and interactive is, as you're saying, is probably more important than, than between print and digital. It um, is to me now. I think it used to really be about this digital and print divide. Um, and that was because there was such dramatic differences in sort of what you could get away with in the two realms. But, but really now it's more about like, are you making a static map 
and there's certain rules that apply for static mapping, whether it's print or not, and then you're making an interactive map. There's a whole other set of considerations for interactive mapping. I'm not much of an inter interactive map maker, but um, uh, there's a lot of other stuff. You know, basically, you have to build the same map over and over and over again yeah. for interactive mapping because you, you need it to work at a whole wide range of scales and, and, mm -hmm. and make predictions about what people want to do with it when they sit down with your interactive map, what's going to be useful and what's going to be garbage and that sort of thing. So. Yeah. Um, and do you usually work on your maps alone with a team? How does what, um, how does that people working? Um, so most of the stuff that I do for fun, obviously is just me. So the Mount Hood map is for me. And so I'm just, I make a lot of that kind of stuff on my own. Um, at Stanford, I get to occasionally do stuff with other people. And this tends to be, um, either, maps for maybe for an exhibit um so you I, I sent you one that was like a map of antarctica that was a map for um for a, a, a symposium we were holding on on glacial uh, maps about glaciers and also glacier glacial studies at, at stanford I, I mostly processed that on my own but i had to have some input from from a few people on what we wanted to have on there it's, it's partially a locator for one particular glacier that we were going to be talking about during the symposium um, then the other map you just had up, which was a map that I did for John Kerry's book that came out a year or two ago, his memoir, Every Day is Extra, I think it's called. This is, this is like a typical client map, right? This is like, I'm basically following their lead. They, they, they know what they want. I, I, have, I bring the style to them and I say, I think this will look cool and we'll, we'll build a map that looks, has these different design parameters. And they kind of okay things or ask for subtle changes here and there. But then, but then there's a lot of direction on, on, you know, please label this river. Don't label these features. We need to nudge this thing over and make sure you include this part of the coastline. So there's, in these cases, this is very much like freelance or, or contract mapping. There's a lot of back and forth. And I've done this a few times with um, other faculty at Stanford where they've got a map they need to put into a book they're writing or a journal article. And it needs to be a little more than just uh, a, a sort of a basic data locator map because I'll, I'll often pass those things off to um, assistants we have in our lab or I'll, I'll help teach an RA how to do some of the work and I'll let them kind of learn the process. But then when it's a little more complicated and I want to make sure that it has, um, it's going to look nice, um, yeah. that I want to get involved directly usually. And so then, it's, then it becomes almost like a client process. Like I'm sitting there, um, the, the faculty is my clients and, mm -hmm. and we're, we're having a lot of back and forth on, on design and style and content and that sort of stuff. Yeah. I, I know that, um, whenever, whenever my, the, the digital cartographer that works in our unit, um, has these backs and forth with, with professors and, and other people he's working with, I always think of, um, Thomas Jefferson being furious at how many mistakes were made on the map that was produced for North Carolina State of Virginia, but he was in Paris and the map makers in London. Uh, it's a much more complicated process when you can't send an email. Um, the communication process can be really difficult, especially when you're, you have sort of knowledge of like best practices. There, I, I, I'm not a rule person in, in map making. I don't think there are any rules. There are very few rules. There are a lot of best practices um, and, and guides to things, but you can always sort of bend these things to do different things. But, but a lot of times there are, there, there are things that people want to do that you're just like, that's, that's, that's terrible. You shouldn't do that. It's really <laughs> hard in the, those kind of circumstances to have. So distance isn't always the, 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 the issue. Yeah. Sometimes it's just, it's just intellectual yeah. distance. It's just ex experiential distance. We just don't have the same background. And it's, you, you can only spend so much time trying to educate someone you're working with before it becomes, you know, there's too much animosity to proceed. So you have to sort of just yeah. try to put in these changes that you want to see and then back off when they demand that something be a certain way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, unlike the majority of cartographers, uh, you have easy access to a big collection of historic maps there at Stanford. Um, and so I wonder what, what you've learned from some of these old maps. You know, I see one, over your shoulder there uh what Boston. kind of yeah um what kind of things you might have learned from looking at these old maps whether it's design choices or tricks or things to avoid um yeah i mean there's a ton of great content in old maps um nothing is new and 
you, you know you can just go look at a lot of the the really cool innovative stuff that that people are doing sort of in map making today and a lot of it looks really neat and cool and new and it's there's just really just reinterpretations of a lot of stuff that's been done before coastal vignetting and and, and water lining and um texturing and 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 symbology and that sort of stuff so there's there's lots of great content there i, I haven't i can't think of a specific case where i've really used a single map and, and said oh i when I, you know, do this exact same thing. Water lining, water coastal features, I really, really pay attention to older maps because there's just a lot of cool stuff. The Boston map has this really cool kind of bluey coastal vignette going on right now. And I love that style of mapping water um, sort of only at the boundary of, of land. Um, uh, like sort of having, being, it's almost, you know, in these cases it was done to be practical, right? It's sort of like why fill all that space with, exp with expensive blue ink when you can just, mm -hmm show a little bit of information about where water is and then we're done with it. Everybody knows the rest of this is water. Um, but that just kind of looks cool too. And so you, yeah, you buy, borrow ideas like that um, from these older maps. We have in our collection um, some amazing Swiss topos, um, the stuff that was in the glacial exhibit that I, I, I um, participated in a few years ago. Beautiful, beautiful maps. And those are, they kind of inform stuff like what I was doing with that Mount Hood topo um, the Swiss topos uh, use some amazing little detail and design tricks to make the maps just work better than a standard topographic mm -hmm. map might where, where say a contour line is one color throughout the entire map and in Swiss topos will do things um, where the contour line changes shading as it goes from, it'll be sort of yellowy as it's in that illuminated region, it'll be bluey colored as it goes through shadowy areas and then it'll take on a different blue color as it goes through ice and snow and and you don't really notice this but if it wasn't like that you would notice it you'd see these dark lines on top of everything mm -hmm. um and so there's those kinds of things techniques find their way into modern cartography all the time um old map symbology is fascinating to me i've done a lot of digital extractions for um sea monsters from old ortelius maps from from our collection i love to just uh, so I like deconstructing these kinds of things. So I sort of pull out the sea creatures from the maps, digitize them, mm -hmm. turn them into vectors. And then they just sort of just become like digital vector stamps you can put into anything. They're kind of fun to play mm -hmm. with. Um, we've got a collection of maps right now. Um, we, it's called the Conrad Collection. And it's, it's, it's either 1,500 or 3,000 maps. I can't remember which. Uh, just amazing, the most, the most detailed maps of... Um, these, are, these are Dutch maps of their sort of their the development of their 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 water their hydrology system right so the canals the dikes um uh farmland agricultural stuff um a lot of schematics for different mechanisms in in, in building all this these are all from the 1800s i think mostly from the 1800s uh and the detail in these maps is amazing they have these tiny tiny little symbols and patches for things like um agricultural land and grass and trees and of all the kinds of maps that that do this kind of symbology i've never seen any that had the level of sharpness at the size that some of these little details are at and i just as soon as i saw it i thought i have to extract all of these symbols and so um i'm actually working with a group of other folks at stanford including um andrew olson who you talked to last week who's our map curator at, at, at branner library she's, our, uh, she's kind of heading this conrad project going through all the material um, and she started a, a little group of us to go through and pull all those symbols off these maps and just try to find something fun to do with them, which is cool. So that's, that's the kind of stuff I like to do. Just go yeah. in and find things that are interesting in maps and deconstruct them. And maybe someone can use them for something else later, apart from sort of how, the, how that little piece of a map began. Yeah, you can make an, an ArcGIS plugin for, uh, for yeah. Dutch yeah, symbology. Little, yeah, Dutch, Dutch symbol tile set or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just realized uh, that that map of Boston has north on the left. Uh, uh, it's yes, yeah, it's skewed. It's yeah, uh, right. I think it's right way up. Is it? It's it's is kind it? of pointing up to the Point to up. the right on my okay, side yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah, a little yeah. right. it's a little angle. It's not north straight yeah. up though. Yeah, um, um, they were they were trying to fit that into that smaller piece of yeah. paper. It took me it took me a second. <laughs> um, great. Are there any questions from the? Uh, from our viewers if you do put them in the uh the little rectangle with a question on it throw it in there um it'll come up for for us and we can maybe answer it but um you can always 
email people and we like to respond to to questions about yeah. maps but yeah i love i love answering questions about map work and helping people out who are sort of trying to figure some of this stuff out and so um folks can feel free to ping me you i'm easy to find through the the stanford geospatial website gis.stanford.edu or um, um I'm, I'm always on twitter at, at matt bliss um, i don't know if people are part of the GIS chat um, hashtag or not, but that's a great way to kind of um, get, get help as well. Um, here, see, this seems to be a loaded question from, uh, <laughs> from Julie. Hey, I know you. <laughs> um, where do you want to map next? Yeah, boy, I don't know. Um, I, I always uh, have these sort of larger project ideas that I, I'm playing with. And I, lately I've been doing a lot of stuff with, um, tactile maps so i've been doing a lot of this seems to be this thing with me and 3d representations and terrain and so i've been taking a lot of these elevation models and um I don't know, there's it's hard man it's there's a little model right there it's a cement cast model on my dresser back there of mount hood again mm -hmm. um and so i have this thing where i i 3d print terrains of different areas and then i mold them and then i cast cement in them and i've got a whole a thing where i want to make every single one of the major peaks in the cascade series as cast models all to the correct scale so that they're all <laughs> are in scale with each other and then sort of line them up have them sort of as a set lined up on my uh, on my shelf um, going from north to south and you know big to small um, and at the right elevations too so the base so this, this is this is why i haven't done this yet because it's a lot of work but you have yeah. to build each one so that each base is the correct thickness uh -huh. So that the height of the model is its right height relative to all the rest relative to sea level. So this yeah. is the kind of stuff I think about. <laughs> this is the kind yeah. of stuff I want to do. Um, so it's not a map, but it's, it's, it's you know, mappy. Yeah. Um, no, it's in that's interesting. I, um, I have done a lot of work on maps for people with blindness and low vision. So it's interesting to hear, I hear about those kind of models. Um, yeah. So uh, great. Um, well, I hope that uh, you have success in the <laughs> the cement uh, the cement mapping. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming. Next week we have um, Martin Storms, who's the curator of maps and atlases at Leiden University. Um, and I'm sure he will be delighted that you you uh, spoke favorably of all these Dutch Dutch maps. Um, but They're thanks beautiful. again for coming. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. All right. See you all next week. Bye, everybody.